Our Father and our God, we just come unto you, God. Even as we confess in that song, we ask, oh God, that even as we enter into your word, your word will be a shield over us, O Lord, in Jesus' name. You said the entrance of your word giveth light and understanding. And I pray, God of heaven, the understanding you will give to each and every one of us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. That as we hear this word to God, this word will not stand against us on that day, Lord, in Jesus' name. For this word will build us up, O God, to be more like Christ in Jesus' name. This word, O God, will, st will stir us up, O God, to be heavenly conscious, O God, in Jesus' name. Thank you for this, O God, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we are pray. Amen. Amen. I welcome every one of us to today's um, study. Amen service and i pray that god of heaven himself will speak to us expressly lord in jesus name amen. today by the grace of god we're going on with our um teaching on the book of revelation amen our book of revelation is taught every third sunday of the month so we can actually engage in it amen let's open our bibles to the book of revelation chapter 3 from verse 14 to 22 revelation chapter 3 14 to 22 and revelation is the only book that guarantees its reader and the hearers a blessing Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads and hears and does what is written therein, for the time is near. Amen. There's no other Bible, no other passage that spoke of that blessing except Revelation. And I pray that even as we read this word, the blessing that is attached to the book of Revelation will be made manifest in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 3 from verse 14 to 22. To the angel of the church in Laodicea writes, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me refined gold, Rebuy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salves to put on your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they and they with me. To the one who is victorious. I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Whosoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I pray that the blessing of this word will come unto us in Jesus' name. Um, today, like I said, we're going on to that um, to the teaching in Book of Revelation, our Book of Revelation series. We began this teaching about 2017, and we've been going on, Amen. And we said we should devote one Sunday just to teach about it. And we are looking at the last letter of Jesus Christ to the seven churches, the church of Laodicea. So we've seen the church of Ephesus, we've seen Simnia, we've seen Pagamom, we've seen Titeria, we've seen Sardis, and now we are looking at Laodicea. Amen. And this church, to each church, Jesus reveals himself in a certain way. In this church, he reveals himself in three, to, uh, as three things. He reveals himself as the Amen, who is all and all. Amen. Who is everything you need to know. That's what Jesus Christ revealed himself as. He said, I am the one that is an answer to everything you will ever need or you will ever imagine. Amen. And that's Jesus Christ for us. Also, he reveals himself as the faithful and the true witness. As one who is the epitome and the, and the standard of faithfulness. Let me tell you, there's nothing else that can show faithfulness except Christ. Moses, in some way, tried, was angry and said some things. Jesus Christ, in everything he did, was pure. He was faithful to the cause. It was a true witness. He did not add to it. He did not take away from it. Moses could not enter into the um, promised land. Why? It was not true enough to the, to the word. God told him, speak to the rock. What did he do? He struck the rock. When you're speaking of someone who was faithful and a true and true witness to what was, uh, was given to him, that is Jesus Christ himself. And that's what Jesus Christ has called us to do. He has called us to be witnesses, not anything. Don't try to make a name for God. Don't try to cajole and tell people what you do not see. Just tell him what you yourself experienced. Amen. A witness, not a lawyer. Today, many people are lawyers for God. They're trying to fight for God. Our God is God. He can fight for himself. 
And I pray God we help us in Jesus' name. And the last revelation of Jesus Christ to the church of Laodicea is, is the ruler of God's creation. Is the one that is above all. Is the one that feels all. Is the one that himself is all things. Amen. Is the beginning and is the end of all creation. Without him, nothing was created that has been created. Amen. Is the one that holds all things together. And I pray that God himself will make himself manifest in our lives in Jesus' name. That we saw about last month on Jesus Christ, um, Jesus in Laodicea. And we said also that five ways you can read the book of Revelation and the letters of the book of Revelation. We said the first one is, um, which we talked about, Jesus' unique revelation to each church. To every church, Jesus revealed himself in a certain way. No two church had the same way Jesus Christ revealed himself. I can tell you to each and every one of us here right now, we see God in different ways. To me, God is a God who is strong and mighty. The one who is the king of hosts, the one who is strong and mighty in battle. To somebody else, is the one who heals their diseases. To somebody else, God is the God who provides. To somebody else, God is God who, who has brought him from the merry clay and has set him among his princes. To somebody else, God is the God who has dumbfounded the, the powers that are challenging their household. Amen. The second um, way you can read each letter is there's a commendation to each church. There's something Jesus Christ speaks about each church. Sadly, not all people, we have commendation, even as Christians. And that's why we are here today to study about the three kinds of Christians in the church. Three types of Christians. There are some who we hear the words and say, enter into my rest. My faithful servant. And the psalm whose word will be, get behind me, you workers of iniquity. I pray that the latter will never be our portion in Jesus' name. The third thing that was seen in each letter is Jesus rebuked to each church. Amen. Jesus rebuked each church. He told them what you have done wrong. And when, if you read that our, our passage, um, Revelation chapter 3, it said, um, verse, um, I believe verse 19, he said, those I love, I rebuke and discipline. And I will tell you, it's only a child that the father loves that he rebukes. I don't go on the streets rebuking every child and say on the streets. Why? I don't have, I feel like this failure will not matter to me. Despite, yes, in some way, I want them to be good. But to be honest, I'd rather focus on my own children and rebuke them rather than rebuke those on, on, on the streets. And the fourth thing we saw about in each letter is this. There was a, always also something Jesus Christ uses to admonish. Yes, it's not just a God who points your mistakes, but it's a God who tells you the way out. Who tells you, yes, you have done wrong, but this is the way out. What we are going to say today, I want you to reflect. So this teaching might not be something anyone wants to hear. Amen. It might actually be more of a rebuke, more of a pointing finger than anything. But in all of it, I want you to know that there's still a way out. As long as you still have breath, you still have a way to correct your destiny. Jesus Christ told Judas, why have you allowed the devil inside of you? But he chose to still go his path. I pray that the God of heaven will grant us the grace to choose the good path in Jesus' name. And the last way by which you can read in that book, in every um, uh, letter, there's always um, something Jesus Christ promises each church. To him who is victorious, I will give a white na- a new name, a white stone. Uh, it will, it will, I will write the name of my father on him. Things like that. It promises something. And also, there are some anticipated judgment that is upon some certain churches. To the church of Titeria, he said, I will put your children, you and your children, on a bed of sickness. Amen. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. So this teaching will be considering, like I said, we'll be considering the second part of how to read the, um, um, the, the letters to the seven churches, which is Jesus' con- commendation to the church. Amen. And like I said, because of this, we'll be looking at the three kinds of church, the three kinds of Christians in the church. Because in this church of Laodicea, you might actually ask yourself, then what is the commendation in the church? What is the commendation? So this teaching might be something that will make you laugh, will make you sh- say, Amen! You know, we've gone past that level where everything we do in church is about the feel-good messages. You know, feel-good messages are good to some point, but they are not what will save you. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 2. 
the scripture clearly says in Ezekiel 7 2. It says it is better to go to the house of mourning rather than go to the house of feasting. Go to a place where you can reflect on your destiny. You can reflect on your own life and say, Oh God, what am I doing here? One thing is sure we will all die. No matter how mighty the man of God is, we will pass on. Billy Graham, no, not Billy Graham. Um, there's another Graham. No, no, no. He, the, the old one. He was uh, Graham. Oh, Billy Graham. I think he was either Graham or something. Like, I think his name was Graham. This was a man that showed God so much power that when he died, his followers did not believe that this man would die. They did not bury him until he began to stink. Because they believed that God's power was so much in him. Which indeed, yes, it was. But of course he died. I will tell you, you like it or not, we are all going to the same place. Let's read Ezekiel 7 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For death is a destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. The living should remember that they will all die. The living should know that one day they will be asked, What have you done with the time I've given you? Amen. And that's why today I want you to look inward. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5, he said, examine yourself if you are still in the faith. You only fail the test if you are reprobate. Today I'm calling everyone, even myself, to ask, my, to ask, what is it that I'm doing that makes me a Christian that God will commend on that day? Like we said, there are three kinds of Christians in the church. To some, God will give honor he will command, I will tell them, sit at my right hand. Sit on the throne with me. And to some other people, he will cast to hell. But I pray that God of heaven will grant us the grace so we will be able to reflect and take the right steps in Jesus' name. And lastly, let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. Because today, all we hear mostly in churches is about prosperity, wealth, you can be all you can be. You can be all what God wants you to be in life, which is good. But if our faith in God is only in this life, we are men most miserable. If all I desire is only in this life, then I have not gotten enough. People, um, the, um, the CEO of, um, uh, what do you call that place? Amazon is not a Christian. He has more, more, more money than any Christian you can imagine. No believer on earth, at least as of today, has as much money as the CEO of Amazon. So, if you think that um, God supplying my needs is all I need from God, then, then what was the point? Then I'd rather just join Amazon and do whatever he's doing and become as rich as him without God. He became wealthy without God. If you're thinking you're, you're the most healthy person, there are people who never serve God one day and as healthy as a donkey. There are people who has never walked in the church and it seems as if everything is going well for them. So if you think that your Christianity is all about how much I make, you know, I want to receive this in this world, then we are men most miserable. One day we are all going to stand before God and we are going to give account of our lives. We are going to make sure, we are going to stand there and tell him what we have done in this body. And then, then, that's when our, 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 our life here on earth will make sense. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. So like I said, today we'll be going and we'll be studying those three Christians in the church. Three types of Christians. And I can tell you, even in this small number, that three number, that three categories, they are here. Except we want to lie to ourselves. Even the ones Jesus Christ himself unpicked, the three kinds of Christians were in their midst. Peter ended up being the, a solid foundation of the believers in his time. And Judas ended up as an example of those who, who put their hands on the plow and go back. So don't think that, oh, because I, I've preached before. Judas preached. He casted out demons. Demons were subject to him. He was there when Jesus Christ broke bread and he multiplied and he fed 5,000 people. And yet, his destiny was in a field with his um, um, abdomen it open. I pray that will never be our portion in Jesus' name. Before I go into this teaching, I just want to tell you a story, something that really happened to me. As a teacher, 
whatever I have to do, first of all, God tries to use something that I've, that I've done before or, or I'm seeing to show me what is going to happen. When, uh, as, as a boy growing up in Kano, um, the ministry, they have this, um, bear, uh, this land, so most of the, the, um, the staff now take certain land for themselves and begin to plow and grow things. So we also had a farm. Ours, we eat all the corn. Everything we plant, we eat in our home. But a friend of mine, they actually sell theirs. So one day, I went to help my friend harvest the corn. And this is what he told me. We're going to have three piles for the corn we harvest. So we take everything down. We, all the uh, corn cobs, stocks, we bring everything down. He said, we're going to put everything in three piles. The first pile, the ones that you see that are big, that is full, when you open it, the corn is almost at the tip of it. Those ones put in this pile. That is the one my father really wants. That's the one we are going to sell. That's what we are really here for. The second pile is the one you open. You see that it looks like it's getting some rot at the top. I'm sure for those of us who have been to the farms before, you are shaking your head. You have never even seen a real corn. You, you see corn in the superstore. For, you know, you see corn and so that some that it looks like the head is almost getting rotten. You can't really sell that in the market. It's soft. So you have to be, at, at times you actually see worms inside of it. And um, if you even open it, some of them, it's not really full. The corn on it, is on the cob, it's not really full. It's scanty. He said, those ones, put on this pile. And he told me, the last one is the one that is even just is bad. That one, just throw on this pile. We're going to give it to our goats, give it to our sheep. We're going to make it. If you see on the screen, I gave a category of the three kinds of corn on that day. Some that when you open it, there's nothing there. Some, there's just, yes, it looks rot on the top, but people who plant it can eat it at home. And the third one is what the father himself really wants. And I, even as believers, these are the three kinds of people in the church today. Jesus Christ is that sower who has gone forth to sow the seed. And yet when many people are growing, when they are becoming that corn, some have made themselves to become that corn that has nothing on it. They can eat it. The only thing it's good for is to burn and to feed the animals. Some, some Christians who have made themselves like that corn, that yes, he has some rot on the head. He has some, you know, some maggots inside of it. He still has some, some cobs, some corn on the cob. Those are the ones the man said, okay, it might not be very bad that I will throw away, but me and my children, we eat. But the third one is what God himself is looking for. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, we read from verse 47 to 49. Again, the kingdom of God is like a net that is cast into the sea, that caught all kinds of fish when it was full. Pull it ashore and sat down and put the good fish in, into containers and threw the bad away. It will be this way at the end of age. Angels will come and separate evil from righteous. You like it or not, there will be a time when God, yes, he has dragged all that net into the church. But on that day, he's going to sit down and say, which one is worthy? The good ones would say, sit at my right hand. And the bad ones, they would cast away. I pray that would never be our portion in Jesus' name. Let's also open our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 13, verse 8. That we're just going to the teaching proper. There are three kinds of Christians in the church. There are three categories of believers in the church. It says, some, that the seed fell on the, on the soil. And, it gave, and it, some came out in hundreds which is the perfect seed which God is looking for. Some came out in the 60s, which was the one that my friend said they're going to eat at home. And some came out in the 30s, when there's nothing actually you can really do with it. Now, let's go in. The first kind of Christians we're going to, the first kind of Christians we're going to look at in the church today is Christians who will be cast into damnation. At first, I called it Christians who will be cast into the lake of fire. But the thing is this, Lake of fire itself, in one day, Bible said, lake of fire and death itself will be cast into the burning sulfur. No, sorry. L, L fire and death will be cast into the lake of fire. 
So perhaps even the writing in your book, you can say Christians who will be cast into the lake of fire. Christians who will be cast into damnation. Christians who have not made themselves worthy to that God will say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Let's read um, Matthew chapter 7 from verse 22 to 23. If indeed you are a Christian, this is the passage you should fear the most in the Bible. If indeed you are a Christian, this passage should be what every Christian should fear the most. Let's read it. Many will say to me on that day, the key word you first of all underline is many. The Bible did not just say few. It didn't say maybe some. Many on that day, many who were in the church, who were baptized, whose names are Mary, whose names are um, John, and things like that, We say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied. Amen. They were not lying. They prophesied in your name. In your name, we drive out demons. They had the ability to, to, to cast out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. But I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. The first category are those Christians who will be cast in the lake of fire. Christians who, yes, they might have, they, they, they have shown some gifts in the church. But because of their lukewarmness, because of their selfishness, because of their works of the flesh, they are cast away. Christians who, yes, they have given to the church, but they are filled to take care of the families. And this is very evident in, um, some, in, 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 in the third world countries. People, they have, they have parents who live in the village, who live in huts, who, do, who don't have lights, and yet they will buy a generator and go and give it to their pastor. And yet they think, perhaps I should do that first. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible clearly speaks about this. It says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially their own household, amen, there's a household, there's relatives, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The Bible never said, he that does not give to his pastor. He did not say, he that does not give to the people. But he that does not take care of his family. I was speaking to a friend of mine on Saturday, and he said, you know, there's some, uh, yeah, in Nigeria, people will come to pass and say, I give you the car. And yet their father will give back to them, who send them to school. They never bought him one single thing. We are putting the, the cart before the horse. And that's why Jesus Christ said, you tight on mint and on things like that, but you have left the very things you should do first, and you're taking care of the, the elementary things. Many, and these are believers who will end up in damnation. Yes, the thoughts they have given the church. And yes, God, Jesus is still telling them, you're worse than an infidel. Why? They have neglected the very things they should do. They will open doors for other people's wives. I say, come in, madam. But when their old wife is coming, they will just leave the door. I say, oh, the, oh, the chief are any. These are people that God himself is saying that you are worse than an infidel. You see other, other men, you, you other pastors, you say, oh, good pastor. You see your owners, man. I say, if you don't go and eat, Food hunger will kill you. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. These are people who come to church, but the word of God has no place in their heart. Yes, they might be in church on, on Sunday, on Wednesday, on Friday, on Saturday for ministers' meeting, and even and again on Sunday. And yet the Bible is saying they have no place in God. Let's open our Bibles to James chapter 1, 22 to 25. James 1, 22 to 25. It reads, he said, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks, in the, looks, who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what it looks like. Whosoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in need, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, they will, be, they will be blessed in what they do. Today, many people say, why am I not blessed? Perhaps you are forsaken what you've just heard. Yes, you give yourself to that. I say, yes, I, I like that word that was spoken. But do you really do it? Do you really give yourself to it? And this, are, this is why I have been saying today, there are many who call themselves Christians and here we go to hell. They hear the word but they did not mix the word with faith. These are the people who hear the word, and yet 
the word has not changed them at all. Somebody told me one time, said, are you guys, um, do your church, do you allow gay in your church? And I told the person, the church of God is a public place. You cannot stop anyone from walking in. But we expect that as soon as you walk in, as you hear God's word, that that chain of perversion in your life will be broken. You cannot tell me that you've, you are a Christian and you're gay. It's not, they are not compatible. You cannot be a Christian and you're gay. The same way you cannot be a Christian and be a robber, I'm a robber. You cannot be a Christian and you're gay. Same way you cannot be a Christian and being a rapist. And many of us always see that, yes, you can be a Christian and be a pedophile. Likewise, you cannot be a Christian and be perverse. Book of Romans chapter 1. It said, he gave them to a reprobate mind to do what is not convenient. Man lusting after man and woman after woman and even a woman exchanging the natural ones with unnatural things. Having dildos and having uh, um, affection and, and intercourse with animals. Things like that are perverse. And these are things that should never be heard. Some of us think that um, it's never in the church. As a young boy, I remember visiting one of my friends. She had the statue of Jesus Christ on, uh, on, uh, by the side of her bed. And right there, she had a dildo next to Jesus Christ. It was even taller than Jesus. And she's a Christian. She'll go to church. These are things that and people call themselves Christians. Those who hear the word, and yet the word never had an impact in them. But I pray that the word of God will have an impact in us in Jesus' name. People who, because of them, the gospel of Christ has become a stench in the nose of people. People who has become the reason why other people have said, I don't want to be a Christian. If that brother is a Christian. If that man you call a, if he's a pastor, I do not want to be a Christian. This man is a liar. He's lazy. He's everything. Ask yourself, if your boss hears that you are preaching the word, will he say that indeed you have done well? Or will he say it does not match what you do at work? Romans chapter 2 verse 24 says, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Today there are people who have made the word, the title pastor, not, not desirable anymore. That's why I never enjoy, I prefer people call me by my first name. I don't even know how we began this title, attachment to your name. There's no part in the Bible where, when, the only time Peter, with, Peter Paul would speak about his place, his title was when he was writing, he said, I, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ who is in chains is writing to you. And when he was referring to uh, Timothy, who was a pastor, he would say, Timothy, I command you to. He didn't say, Pastor Timothy. You hear people say, what's your name? Pastor. Is your name a pastor? You are a bio me, Alabi. Yes, you are a pastor over a church. does not make that your name. But today, people have made such things to even not to be desirable. People, Christians, who will end up in hell. The first category. The category of my friend that said, we can't take them home. Can't even sell them in the market. The best thing we can do is to either burn them or give them to the animals to eat. These are Christians who, for the love of this world, the love of God in their heart has been nullified. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or anything of the world. If anyone does love the world, the, fa- the love of the Father is not in them. These are people who are neither hot or cold. People who they, they, they can't stand for God in any way. People who Jesus Christ will tell them that you have become a stumbling block. It's better for you to kill yourself now. Let's open our Bible to the book of Luke chapter 17 verse 1. I know that some people say, you know, Christianity, we should not be so hard. Uh, we, should, we, should, we should hear what is not as bad. You know, don't make everything as bad. You no, know, you speak about hell and frightening people. Nobody, all the apostles and every body put together, did not speak about hell than, uh, as much as Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus Christ spoke very strong words. Luke 17, 1 says, He said, Jesus said to his disciples, Things that will cause people to stumble are bound to come. But what to whom, through whom it comes? What to that person? It's better, if you read the next verse, He said, It's better that person ties a milestone around his neck and drown himself. Yes, my patience as a pastor will be tested. And it might not come from outside. It must come from inside. And it will come from those who are, who call themselves Christian, but are doomed to hell. 
your faith, your, your, your patience will be tested, but it will be tested by someone who is doomed for hell. Let me tell you, there's, one, there's a mystery about God. He said, as, um, he said fire, uh, wood is good. Uh, as it's good for fire. So you can have something to burn. That's why you have wood. Because there are some people who have to test your faith. That's why such Christians still remain in the church. And we should not be alarmed. There are more than even those who call themselves true Christians. Many on that day will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesy, we cast out demons, we did everything in your name. And Jesus Christ will say, get behind me, you workers of iniquity. People who they are the ones they have, that, that will test your morality, they will test your faith, they will test your patience, they will test everything about God in you. And that's why God, Jesus Christ said that he will spit them out, out of his mouth. Amen. Because they're neither hot or cold. Amen. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Say, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And I pray that will never be our portion in Jesus' name. These believers are the people who, 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 who focus on wealth. Who everything that they are doing is about wealth. How much I have. How much I can accumulate. What I can show forth. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. This is about the church of Laodicea. You say, I am rich. And I have acquired wealth. And need not 18. They are Christians. They claim they are rich. They have acquired wealth. And they are in need of nothing else. Amen. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. These are Christians who all the focus is about wealth. About the best life I want to live. A Tesla, the bad house, seven-seater house, and all the good things of life. They are focused on those things more than living for God. They are, they are focused about living for God as is now at the back burner. When Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he was saying, speaking, he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and partake of his suffering, becoming more like him in his death. And so, somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. We, that's what we need to focus on. But these people don't want to partake in the suffering of Christ. They don't want to have to borrow anything. They want to have all they need. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. This category of Christians are the ones that we end up in damnation for they are Christians that we have refused to witness. They are, they are Christians who have refused to engage in expanding God's kingdom. When Paul said, he said, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. These are the people who don't really think that they, there's anything that they need to focus on. People who don't really think out about, oh, will it make any difference? I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Like I said, Believers like this or people like this need to make a choice. Let me tell you, Christ, um, Christianity is not a place where we beg anyone. It's true that we are praying that everyone will be saved. But the Bible, God himself spoke in Revelation chapter 22. He said, he that is righteous, let him do what? Remain, remain righteous still. He that is holy, let him remain holy still. He that is wicked, let him remain wicked still. And he that is vile, let him remain vile still. So make a choice. Don't be that Christian that we end up in hell. Let me tell you, it does not pay, it does not make any benefit to you. At least, and for the thing is this, you are not enjoying hell, you are not enjoying the world in its fullest. The time you should be golfing, you are in church. Let me, know, let me tell you, if I know that I cannot make heaven, then why am I wasting my time? Then I will live my life as in the fullest. There's no need to get married. Just Keep spreading your oats everywhere. But I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. These are people who are in the company of Judas. Yes, they may claim that they walk with God. They may claim that they rebuke demons. They may claim that they preach the gospel. But because of greed, they have lost their place in God. These are people who have become like Balaam. Yes, they have. Let me tell you, Balaam was a man that God was sitting in his bedroom. If I come visit you, depending on my relationship with you, there are places you will put me. For those in North America who have two living rooms, if someone who you are not very used to comes to your house, what do you do? You put them in your first living room. And the second one, if people get very close to you, you take them to your inner living room, family room, right? And for those who are very close to you, they can come into your walk-in closets. God was in the 
bedroom of Balaam when Balak came to visit him. God told him, who are those in waiting for you in that room? And he said, oh, it's just Balak, you know, he wants me to help him um, um, prophesy and, and curse the children of Israel. And God told him, don't go. Yet he pleaded with God, you know, God, I want to go. These are people who had a communion with God, but because of greed, they let go. I pray that will never be our portion in Jesus' name. We have spoken extensively about the Christians who will not make heaven. Christians who will end up in hellfire. Christians who will end up in lake of fire. Christians who has no place in God. And that's why, as believers, we are stressing so much upon it so we can try and desist from that place. I pray God we all pass in Jesus' name. The second category of Christians we will be looking at is the 60-fold Christians. And these are those who are saved. Yes, they will be saved at the end, but they will be left with no reward. Let's open our Bibles to the book of um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'll read from verse 12 to 15. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will, be, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, but he will be saved, even though as only as one escaping from the flames. Somebody asked me one time, is it possible that um, you go to heaven and you have no reward in heaven? Yes. But is that what we should follow after? No. This is a category of Christians who their faith is genuine. Yes, they are actually strong. They actually, they actually, their faith is genuine in God. But these are people who they, they, they have already received their reward here on earth. Yes, the things they have done, people have already given them their accolade here on earth. And so they have no place in God. And I can tell you, at times it's, it's, it's humanly satisfying for people to tell you that you've done well. You, we want to hear that. Well, you cannot eat your cake and have it. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 6. 6, 2 to 3. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your, your giving may be in secret, then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Amen. You should give and you should do things to honor God, so people won't give it to you already. And these are Christians who already, yes, they are living that Christian life, they are praying. But it seems as if their prayer is more in church than in, a, in private. If you tell them, there are some people, when you tell them, uh, pray over the food, you know that you have... That food must get cold. They will kabash and bind everything on the food. And why Paul said, he said, if whatever I said before you, with thanksgiving, eat. Do not question. Amen. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Yes, heaven is our ultimate goal, but we need to understand that we have, we also have things reward in heaven. Like I said, what we're going to look like or what heaven is going to feel like, we don't really know at this time. But I'll give you um, a testimony of a, of, of, a, uh, of a lady, of a very old woman that saw heaven. This woman in the village, she, whenever the pastor, you know, she makes, she has corn farm, so she will make a, um, um, a call, what do you call that in English? Corn meal in, uh, in a wrap, corn meal. So she will take it and give it to the pastor. When they say, we are looking for chairs, she will not bother. But, oh, what can you give? She will bring corn meal and give it to people. So she died. Or she had a near-death experience. She died. She saw heaven. And they told her that um, your house, you can't, you can't stay in your house at this time. She got into heaven and they told her she has to go back. She said, no, I don't want to go back. This place is beautiful. They said, there's no way you can stay here. All you have in your house is 
cornmeal. <laughs> so she has lots of cornmeal. No roof, no window, no walls. She said, really? They said, yes. When they were saying that they should give chairs, you said there's no need. So there's no way for you to see. So you didn't put any chairs, chairs here. When they were talking about who wants to give money for ceiling, you didn't put money for it, so you don't have any ceiling here. So all you have is the cornmeal. So you have to go back. So when she came back, she, when she had that experience, she came back and she said, now I want to give everything I'm lacking in my house. My house needs drapes. She gave drapes to the church. My house needs chairs. She gave chairs to the church. Like I said, this is one person's experience. It does not mean that's how heaven is. That's not how heaven works. But that's how God showed it to her to prompt her to do better. Likewise, many of us are going to go to heaven on that day and not have as much stars as other people. Why? We are filled in some ways. Let's read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 14, 41 to 42. 1 Corinthians 15, 41 to 42. It said, The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And the stars differ from stars in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. On that day, some of us will rise into power, into glory, and will be like the sun. Some other people will be like the moon, who will mimic our glory of the sun. And some people will be like the stars, who they will shine, but they are not very shining. They are not shining very bright, but there will some will be so dull. You are not even sure if it's sun or it's just a speck, but they are still stars. The Bible said on that day, that house is going to look like. And this is the second category of people in the church, who yes, they are Christians. But their stars are not shining bright enough. They are saved as if they have not been snatched from, the, from fire itself. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. And these are people, because of laziness, of slothfulness, you know, they have not made their works perfect before God. But I pray that our works will not be burnt up in Jesus' name. And now, shortly, we're going to talk about the last kind of Christians in the church. We've seen two types of Christians already. We've seen the Christians who will end up in hell. Um, lake of fire. The second Christians are Christians, yes, who will be saved, but they will have no commendation. Their stars will not shine bright in heaven. And the third one is Christians who will be saved, but will share in their master's honor. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. If there's anything you want to desire, you want to remember today, remember this. Be the Christian that God would say to, to that day, enter into my rest. My faithful servant. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Amen. And I pray that the grace will share in our master's happiness. That grace God will give to us in Jesus' name. These are Christians who have given up themselves. Who have sold themselves to God in every way. Christians who said that is, I, I, I count everything as a loss. That I'm again Christ. Christians who, be, who are like Pete, uh, Paul in Philippians 3, verse 8, who says, What is more? I consider everything lost because of the surpassing words of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all. I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I'm again Christ. Amen. Believers who are sold out. Believers who say, that woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Believers will say, I will suffer with Christ. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Believers will say, going to jail is nothing to me. For the name of Christ, I will do it. Believers will say that even if God does not deliver me from this fire, I will not bow to the king. I will not bow to the world. I will not give in to the world. Even if I don't receive that promotion, I will not follow them and do what is not of God. I told my brother, when I first came to Canada, and I remember I told my brother that I know that if I wanted to get that promotion, all I just need to do is do, I'm gay. I, and I honestly, it's true. If I wanted that promotion that badly, all I just need to go to work one day, I tell my boss, hello, next day you are getting promoted. Amen. The category which God is looking for are people who are worthy ambassadors of Christ. That people will look at them and say like the, like the brothers in Antioch, that these are Christ-like. They say the brothers were first called Christians in Antioch there. That people will look at you and say, this man is a Christian. 
he walks like Christ, he talks like Christ, he thinks like Christ. A man, a woman, who, who the same mind that was in God, in Christ Jesus, is in him. But it is sad to say that as Jesus Christ could not say anything about the church of Laodicea, there are some people who Jesus Christ would not be able to say anything about them. And some people are even saying, oh, yes, oh, at least if I make heaven, I'm fine. And this is where the Bible speaks about being complacent. It's in the book of Amos, chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Woe unto those who are at ease in Zion, who be complacent in Samaria, who say, I've already put my hands on the plow. I don't need to do anything more. God is saying, Woe to them. Let me tell you, like we said, those who, the second category are people who, made, who missed hell by chance. Like we said, nobody makes heaven by chance. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. But you can miss it. So the second category are people who actually missed hell by a slight chance. They were saved from fire. They were snatched from fire. The kingdom of God is not for mediocres. It's for those who are diligent in the work in their work with God. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, it said, For since the days of John the Baptist and until now, the kingdom of God suffered violence, and only the violent can take it by force. It is not for those who, who are complacent, who say, you know, it's okay, it's fine. Let me tell you, we are all, and I tell people, especially in North America, as long as you are doing this ministry, we all have full-time jobs. So the same way you go to work on Monday, I go to work on Monday. So if we say that we have service on Sunday at 10 a.m., don't think that I slept 20 hours extra. I just came to the hours extra. Amen. And that's why the Bible also says in the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. It says, work hard to show your... The, I'm reading the uh, NLT version. It says, work hard to show the result of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. While the um, King James, the um, NIV will say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. The heaven is a prepared place where we have to work out our salvation. In conclusion, you can write down Matthew chapter 25 from verse 14 to 30. You can read it at home. Matthew 25, 14 to 30. That was speaking about the parable of the, um, of the gifts. He gave some uh, five. He gave some two. He gave some one. And the one that had one <laughs> didn't do anything with it. And said, you know, I just they are all believers. They are all working for the master. And also, if you read Matthew chapter 22 from verse 1 to 14, that's the parable of the wedding. Yes, everybody was brought in. But when the master of the house was going in, was going um, around the banquet, he saw a man who does not have the uh, wedding garment. He said, where, where, why don't you have a wedding garment? He said, cast him out. And two things, one or rather, one thing is, is, is um, common or synonymous to those two parables. The one that had one talent that did not use it, and the one that does not have a uh, wedding garment, were thrown out into the outer darkness where there's gnashing of teeth. Both of them. Likewise, there are Christians who will be thrown out in, the, in, the, in darkness on that day. And this is a great tragedy for us to assume that we have put our hands on this plow. If you like it or not, Christianity is hard. Christianity is a straight path where you have to give up everything. You have to shed everything to walk on this path. You cannot be a Christian on this path and be angry. You cannot be a Christian on this path and yet keep grudge. You might have to be the one that will say sorry. Last week, I had to call someone and I apologize for something that I said that I believe was right, but I still, but the person said he felt it's wrong and I still had to apologize to the person. I still had to apologize and say I'm sorry. Why? Because I, I believe I'm a Christian. And I still told the person, I know that because I analyzed, I, I analyzed what I said in, in all facets, in every way, but I said, I, I still think you sh shouldn't have said it. Or even if you, if you think it is, even if you know that, if you know it's true, you shouldn't have even said it out to me. And I still have to say I'm sorry. Christianity is that place where the husband might have to look at his wife and say, I'm sorry. I honestly, Chris, you might think, that's why I told my wife, we never go to bed without making compromise to each other. There are times 
that when it's very hard, then and the issue is this: two people don't feel, don't fall same time. That's one thing about about this work. Two people don't fall same time. When I'm strong, now, remember, that might be when she's weak. And when she's not saying I'm angry, then I will not be the one to say, "Let's pray, Father, in Jesus' name." Then after a while, she get into it. And the day also that I'm angry at something, she will not say, "Let us pray." That she not start praying, and the prayer will not be more than five minutes. At one point, at first, and because I'm still angry, when she say in Jesus' name, I will not say amen. I'll just uh, then later on when she keep saying the words once again, I will not. Then the next amen will be in my heart, and I say amen in my heart. Then later on when she just said, Father, everything that we have done that will keep us away from you, Father, forgive us. Then after a while, I will not say amen, amen. Then after a while, then I'm getting there. Christianity is something that you have to give up yourself. Yes, you are the father. You still have to treat your child with respect. That he will not, for your own sake, say, I don't want to serve this God. Look at people into history. People who are now atheists are people who had bad fathers. Charles Darwin. His father was a minister, but he was a very bad father. And that was why this man felt like God cannot be true. How can my father say he's a Christian and yet he did everything that's not God-like? And that was why he looked for a theory to look for how he came here. He thought, I can't come from what my father believed. I have to come from a monkey. At least. Makes sense to him. And we've never seen any monkey that's become a human being. I pray God we help us in Jesus' name. As Christians, we need to know that our path is very straight. It's very narrow. And we need to make sure we, we follow that path to the very end. And I pray God we help us in Jesus' name. The scripture says that in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, it says, Everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or wife, or children, or fields for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and we inherit eternal life. Imagine you've left all these things, and yet you don't make back any of those things. Is it not, isn't it not miserable? Some of us, we've been hated. We've been called names. And like I always say, if you go to a party that is organized by unbelievers, it's much fun than parties that are organized by Christians. And yet some of us chose to stay in the camp of a Christian because we don't want to perverse God. We don't want to perverse our faith. And yet, we won't make heaven. The Bible said in the book of Luke chapter 9, verse 16, uh, 62, it said, Whosoever puts on his, his hands on the plow and looks back, he's not worthy of me. I pray God we help us in Jesus' name. Lastly, I just want to just read Revelation 22, 11 to 12. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. Let the person who, let the, let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. I will give to each person according to what they have done. I just want to just bow our heads and just pray. First Corinthians chapter nine verse twenty-seven says, "Said I put my body under subjection, that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified." I just want to pray and say, Father, I commit myself to you, that I will not be disqualified in the end in Jesus' name. That my testimony will not be that I was in the camp of Judas Iscariot. My testimony will not be that I was in the camp of Balaam. My testimony will not be that I was in the camp of Cain. When he wanted the gift, he sought it with strong cries, but he could not attain it. But, O God of heaven, O Lord, help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. That, O Lord, my faith, O God, will not be in vain. That, my, that, that the grace you put on, upon me, O God, will not be in vain in the name of Jesus. But the grace to put my body under subjection. That, that grace you give to me, Lord, in Jesus' name. You will help me, O oh God. You show me your favor, O oh God. And also, I just want to just pray. I come to Luke chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Sir, the man replied, Leave it all for one year, and I will dig around it and fertilize it. I just want to just be in a prayer. Say, Mighty God, put around me resources. Put around me, O oh God, people. Put around me things, O oh God, circumstances, O oh God, that will prompt me to serve God in Jesus' name. That even as you told that, um, you told the gardener, he said, cut down this tree. He's been using up my soil for the past three years. He has not bothered. He has not given any fruit. Why should I keep it? But the gardener said, let me put 
fertilizer around it. Let me put soil around it. Perhaps it will grow. Oh God of heaven, mighty God, put around me resources, oh God, people, circumstances, oh God, that will lead me to, to, to my upbuilding, oh God, as a, as a Christian and fruit bearing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you, God, and I give you praise. I give you glory and honor, oh God. In Jesus' name, we are praying. Amen. Our Father and our God, oh Lord, we come unto you today. As we have heard this word, the three types of Christians in the church, which are you? We pray the grace to be the Christians that will share in their master's glory, in their master's honor, that will share in their master's joy. Let that be our portion, oh Lord, in Jesus' name. And as many, of oh God, are still in the camp of, of being cast to hell, or not receiving any reward at the end, I pray, God of heaven, you open our eyes, that we might see our errors and turn our way to the Lord in Jesus' name. Thank you for all you've done, God. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, we are praying. Amen. We pray God has blessed you as you've watched this message. Now, if you would like more resources, then please visit our website at www.likechapel.ca or call us at 403-800-7162 or best yet, fellowship with us at Unit 243-1830, 52nd Street, Southeast, Calgary, Alberta. In Canada, we are together every Sunday for worship at 10 a.m.